the belief that energetically that space totally, is held yeah. for others. And I don't feel I'm this powerful human being who's who's the one that everything rests on sure. and has the answer to everything. And I think right. that's what allows me to be liberated from it. Yeah, nice. Where I'm not like, I also don't put the pressure on myself going, God, I better say the most I, perfect thing to this. <laughs> I better change this person's <laughs> life. life. Yeah, and I can't. And I don't, and I, and I think once upon a time, I probably did feel that way. Like right. when, you're, when you're immature and you're an amateur in your work, you almost feel like you have to have all the answers. Sure. And now I'm like, you know what, I don't, and it's fine. And actually people really appreciate it mm -hmm. when you just, chat to them and yeah. you know and but it was it was that exact feeling where it was like he was someone that I felt I could open to at that open up to at that point in my life without feeling judged without feeling like he was going to see me through another lens and just having that space to be seen for as a human who was going through stuff totally. by a teacher was a huge huge win and so you know it's you are right that that help can come in all different forms and it does it doesn't have to come in the ways that we expect it to come in yeah it doesn't have to be a professional yeah i go to my friends a lot and, and, you know, some friends are better than others in certain <laughs> situations. I've got some friends that are very much like pull your socks up and get on with it. And then yeah. other friends who are like, come here and have a cry on my shoulder. But like it, it varies. So I, I, yeah. I just really hope that that's what the show can do is, yeah. is sort of paint this positive picture of asking for help is something to be proud of. Well, that's a great message. And, and I think we all, we all need to hear it. And it was special. I've always been so tempted to go away and do one of those retreats where, you know, you go to somewhere like India and you go to those places where you don't speak for a month or something like that. Like that must have just been the most enlightening experience. I met a guy, I was on holiday earlier this year and he had just got back from a retreat. He did two weeks where he didn't make a sound mm -hmm. and was just explaining to me how eye-opening it was. Yeah. No, I, I mean, to me, it was one of the best experiences of my life because even the stuff that I did then, I was 22 years old when I did it. Even the stuff that I did then, I don't even know if I'd be able to do it anymore now, but right. there was such a like energy you had as a 22 year old sure. where you just open to any experience and wanting to try it all out. Amazing. It must've been how powerful he was, but I just decided, I was like, I want to do this because I'd met someone who I felt had emotional and mental mastery in a way that I'd never seen before. Oh, so anything amazing. I'm good at today is because of that. And again, the other thing we were talking about this earlier, going back to it was you decided to take a break from acting again you were saying that that was misconstrued and i just before we dive into why you needed to take a break and and what was challenging about it it's only a break from acting because i'm an actor yeah it's not like the acting itself i just have been so lucky that in my life i've been working so much i just wanted to take a break i just wanted to be in one place for a while i wanted to be with my friends be with my family move into my house so it wasn't necessarily oh my God, I need to have a break from acting because it's too much. Yeah. I just needed to have a break from traveling and, and working. And, and also I've done so much of my growing up on the road. At the same time, I was reflecting on my music clients who have to do 100, 150 shows. Mm -hmm. A lot of them pull out of doing their tours. A lot of them announce, kind of like you're saying, I took a break. A lot of them will announce and say, you know what, guys, I can't, I I can't, can't finish. I can't yeah. do it anymore. And it's really interesting because I messaged some of them straight away saying, I always could understand why you needed that. Sure. Now I actually have actual empathy for you. 100. I'm older and I have a certain set of skills that help me with that mm -hmm. based on my monk life and all the rest of it. But I, got, I can imagine if you've been touring since you were 15 years old, which is what a lot of these artists have done. Yeah. You've, like you just said, you grow up on the road and then all of a sudden you're like, well, who am I and who are my friends and, and what is my life? And now totally. everyone that I pay is my friend and that's the only friends I have. And, and then I found out as the 89th show and I was thinking, gosh, like it is so hard. But at the same time, I was really intentional about building community and family. Mm -hmm. And it was like an actual like thought process where I was like, as well as you're always building the people you know at work, you're always building relationships, you're hiring employees and team members and everything. At the same time, I've got to think about actually making friendships because yeah. in London, I've got all my mates. So I've got the, my best man at my wedding. I've been mates with Raj for like 17 years. Like I've got people around me, but in LA, I don't have that. I don't have any right. family, any friends. I don't know anyone. And so I've really made an effort. And now after five years, I can honestly say, you know, obviously not in a wonderful way, but the pandemic did help deepen some of those friendships mm -hmm. because I was stuck with those people. Sure. So I only could go deeper. I made some really good friends. Nice. And so I feel happy there. And I feel really connected to my purpose there. And at the same time, I love coming back to London right. and hanging out with my mates. And so I but that said, I am always looking for ways to kind of remove myself from it, to kind of just live as normal a life as possible. 
today doing this is a very rare thing for me to do. Like in London to come in and speak to someone about my life is something I would not typically do, but because I'm a fan of yours and I was keen to kind of hear what you had to say and, and chat to you today. I felt like this would be a safe space for me to do that. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it has been an ongoing thought, which is don't lose yourself. I've seen so many people come before me and lose themselves. And I've had friends that I've grown up with that aren't friends of mine anymore because they've lost themselves to this business. And I just am really, really keen to focus on what makes me happy, which is my family. It's my friends. It's and I see that at the top, which we're, we've talked a lot today about, and, and you're really good at this. Like you really, I feel like, I feel like you're quite tuned into like admiring and observing greatness and like the 1% and, sure. and trying to figure out what they're doing differently. And I think that's one of the things I've definitely seen of the 1% is that there's a humility in that they have the ability to appreciate other people's greatness and skills mm -hmm. and values and purpose. Like they're not looking at it going, I'm the best of all time. Sure. There's a part of that. They, they may have to say that for the cameras or they may have to say that before they go on the pitch. But actually, if you talk to them and you ask them about someone else, they'll be like, yeah, best, best player I've ever seen. Like they're right. incredible. And yeah. so who did you admire growing up in acting? Who do you admire today? Like who have been the people that... And maybe on a mindset level or maybe on a, or, or a performance level as well. There are definitely performances of people that I look up to. There are, there are the types of careers of certain actors that I really admire. Nothing you can do. Nothing, nothing you can do. And so we're walking, they're walking around us and this massive silverback came up. So I'm, uh, my business manager was with me as well. And so he's there. He's like my godfather in LA. Like he sure, really sure, looks, sure. takes care of me. Love so it. very close to him. And so this big, um, this big gorilla that walks behind him and I'm looking at him going, oh man, like he stopped and we're all looking at him because he's got this massive silver back behind him. And I'm, and we're all like, how do we tell him to move? And the guy's like, just be still, like just, you know, be really present. Like you can't freak out. And the gorilla just went <clears throat> wow, behind him amazing. and he moved out the way and just walked past. Wow. And it was just, it was that same presence that you're feeling that I felt with them. And that's what I mean. The sure. living, being with another living being is, is spectacular. So. And I had that moment where I was like, what do I want to do? This thing that's been a hobby, but my sort of summer holiday activity, which is acting, I could try and do that for a living. And I've been so lucky that I've been, you know, offered jobs and all that sort of stuff. I decided to go with it. So I never really wanted this. I just sort of never stopped doing it. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I love the creativity. I love the building blocks that are required to put a film together. I love the collaboration on set between people from all different walks of life. Um, so I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Wow. And and I, I read something that you said you were bullied for like doing ballet. Yeah, right. Early, which obviously got you into the playing the role of Billy Elliot because it's ballet and tap, right? Sure. It's, it's both. So was was that was that tough at the time or like were you trying to hide it? And just they were just a great laugh. And it was yeah. really interesting because we'd go from I'd literally go from playing rugby straight to class on a Saturday and I'd go in there with all my bruises exhausted and yeah, all the yeah, rest yeah. of it. But everyone's just so much fun. Sure. And it's almost like the rugby pitch was more stressful because everyone 100%. was like, you know, trying to be intense and trying to be this and that. Whereas everyone's just having a laugh at the dance totally. class. So we do everything from hip hop to street to Love it. whatever. But yeah, I remember never telling, I, I think this is the first time I've <laughs> ever spoken about it's it. It's out there. Because I'm in a safe space with you. So like, <laughs> but it's interesting because rugby is regimented, isn't it? Yeah. I love rugby, by the you way. Play a, you play a position that is as specific as saying the blind side flanker. You know, when you're a dancer, you're just a dancer. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you can fit in however you want to fit in. Yeah. The teacher can ask you, how are you feeling about that? Rather yeah. than like, you need to get your head down to the left to make a proper tackle. <laughs> I did love playing rugby when I was smaller. Yeah. Uh, so you, you're literally looking around and you could be on the lookout for them for like two to six hours. You may not find them. You're just hiking. Yeah, uh, you might not find yeah, them. Yeah, you might not find them. So we found them in two hours. One group that we heard about, because you go in smaller groups of like 10, the other group that we were friends with, they took eight hours to find gorillas, but they saw them too. And when I went, I was kind of like, oh, we're going to see one gorilla or whatever. Like they're going to be far away. Like I was a bit skeptical sure. because I, I didn't know how it was going to be. And it was incredible because we looked around for two hours and I'll show you the video afterwards, but we got, and we just saw them like hanging out, kind of like how I'm looking at everyone here, just hanging out still. And then all of a sudden they all started walking together and there was a family of 20 gorillas. Wow. And you've got two silverbacks that are like, you know, they're like, their fists are like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like just huge. You slap you and you go. Yeah. And 
what was really interesting for me is not relying on drinking made me rely on qualities and skills I had sure. that were actually better. Yeah. So now that I couldn't drink as an excuse to hang with the lads, I was bringing out parts of my personality that I probably would have just hidden away Suppressed. or ignored. And all of a sudden you were actually getting respected and liked for who you were right. rather than the person who you were when you were drunk. Yeah, totally. suppressed. And actually that worked in the workplace and there was no one at the workplace going, oh, Jay doesn't drink so he's not getting promoted. It wasn't like that. People were like, oh yeah, I really like hanging out with Jay or he's, he's a really good guy or whatever it may be. And I go with my gut a lot. I'm very, very, I think a lot of the decisions I make in life are very sort of instinctual. I don't like to be bombarded with evidence and facts and all that sort of stuff. I just like to feel a certain way about how I would like something to sort of transpire. And the mode of ignorance is where your relationships or any act is based on insecurity or fear. So okay. when you're doing something out of fear or you're doing it out of insecurity or you're doing it out of pressure, that's considered the mode of ignorance. You yeah. know whether you be, I would know whether you were being forced to do this interview today sure. out, of, out of some sort of fear or some sort of right. whatever it may be. The mode of passion is where you're doing something because you want a certain result. You're doing it just for the reward. You're doing it just because it's going to get you what you want. It's going to get you to the goal. I feel really at ease. But I have worked with people that shut their bedroom door and just dive into the character and are pouring through the script every night and, and are in character all the time. And I admire them. I don't necessarily think it's the healthiest way to go about it. But yeah, I've always been really strict on myself to leave my work at work. Obviously, I come home and read the script and do all of my prep work, but I'm not. I'm leaving the character at work because yeah. it's, too, it's too much, especially yeah. when you're playing a character like like Danny from The Crowded Room, like you can't bring that into your personal life. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, but I'm actually glad I asked it to you either way because what I'm actually hearing is you did it early on and you saw it wasn't healthy. Sure. And so you actually found another way. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting because a lot of people may not have found another way or that is their way and that is their method. Mm -hmm. I feel like Harlan's kind of like, I've always compared Harlan to like Ivan Drago. Like he was made in the lab. Right, right, right. Like yeah. he was made... Like he was manufactured yeah, yeah, to be yeah. this incredible talent. He is and, incredible. And I think City's good with like, he, he admits like he scores a lot of tap-ins and I think that's his game. Yeah, but man, and, there's no in a good on way. a scorecard, you know? No, like, no, in a good way. Yeah, I'm saying, totally. I'm saying like he's been built in that way and City played that way. I don't know if Kane's a tap-in guy. Like sure. He's, he's, his, score, his goals have generally been a bit more diverse in that sense. Magic. Like, yeah. Magic is the way yeah. I would describe Kane. Yeah. No, I, lo I love him. <laughs> and obviously it's a typical thing of like the press are out saying, oh, Tom Holland's begging Kane to leave. I'm not begging him to leave. I love that he's at our club because I'd be terrified to see where we'd be without him. But I just love to see him have the career I know he could have. Yeah. What do you think of Jude Bellingham to Madrid? I think that's a great move. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> you just want everyone to I love Madrid. that. And what's, even, what's interesting <laughs> is that all of my friends in Spain are from Barcelona. I have yeah. one friend from Madrid. And we always think we need access to people directly in sure. order to learn from them. But you don't know everyone you've just mentioned, even though you may know a couple of them closely. And, and same with me. Like, I was really fortunate, you know, growing up as a teenager, I got introduced to, like, Martin Luther King's work and Malcolm X's work. And I was reading crazy stuff at that age. But mm -hmm. it had a massive impact on my mindset. I never met all those people and obviously would never have got the opportunity to do that. Um, but this time, I don't know. It was just different. I really worked to sort of change my mindset. I really asked myself, like, why do you drink? Why are you drinking? And a lot of the time my answer would be to feel more comfortable in the social environment. Yeah, I was at the beginning because I didn't feel like I could go and not have a drink because mm -hmm. of the stress of it. But then after a while, I sort of was like, mate, you've got to pull your socks up here and you can't just live in your house all the time. You've got to go out and enjoy yourself. And, and if you're only enjoying yourself because you're drinking, then you really do have a problem. But I just changed my mindset. I just, I found really good replacements, things that I could sort of attribute to having a beer. I often found with me, most of it is just the ritual of cracking something open and sharing it with friends and drinking it. A lot of studies show that how we were loved or unloved between the ages of zero to five impact the next 15, 25, 50 years of our life wow. and how we give love to ourselves and how we give love to others. And so I was thinking, do you have a core memory or an experience with your family from childhood that kind of embodies the feeling you have about them now or that keeps you tied close to them? This is one of the things why I've sort of distanced myself from the rugby community because so much of it is about how much can you drink? Let's get you as drunk as possible. And it's honestly been the best thing I've ever done. I'm, a year and a half into it now. 
It doesn't even cross my mind. I found amazing replacements that I think are fantastic. Ones that are also really healthy. I found this one beer that is full of electrolytes and it's, you know, the carbohydrates in it are long lasting <laughs> energy. So like having a beer is now actually like a really healthy thing. I'm really lucky that all my friends are super supportive about it. I've never run into that scenario where my friends are like, oh, go on, just have a beer. Like you're fine. They've always sort of really supported me. And I don't want to be that person that's saying to people, you should get sober. You should get sober. If I could encourage someone to drink less, then that's great. But I, I don't want to start getting into the world yeah. of you need to stop drinking because I just, it's, it's not for me to say. I went on my own little journey. I'm really enjoying it. I, I'd probably go to something you said earlier, if, if I'm giving a genuine answer, yeah, like yeah, a yeah. real answer, is I really wish there was a life school. Oh, mate. Like I, I, that would be it because I'm not saying that would solve all the problems in the world. No. But it would set people up. And when I say life school, I mean emotional mastery. I mean- 100%. Ego mastery. I mean the ability to be- kind and empathetic and vulnerable and compassionate mm -hmm. and create safe spaces. I think a life school that taught you how to be non-judgmental sure. and non-critical of others without understanding them. I think sure. that's what I mean by life schools. And so I was thinking, do you have a core memory or an experience with your family from childhood that kind of embodies the feeling you have about them now or that keeps you tied close to them? I'd say sort of more than a memory is just a feeling that we, I could say all of my brothers and I had was that because our dad's a comedian, his job only ever existed once we had gone to bed and our mum worked from home. She was a photographer. So to us as kids, our parents didn't really work. They just were always home. So we had this amazing foundation where no matter any time of the day, either mum or dad would be at the house. And we felt so kind of solid as a family, which is why like, I kind of have this dream of one day having kids and putting my work to bed and just kind of being there as a dad. Because I really admire how my dad was around, you know, being a comedian is a very, very volatile job. He got him back in the boat and he sort of said like, lads, you have to get in. There is, it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. My brother Harry's like Googling whether or not it's safe to swim with them. And it's sort of... The general consensus online is don't go swimming with killer whales. Boxing, yeah. it's been a few years since I've, I've done any sort of training. I used to go to this great gym in, um, in New York called Church Street Boxing. Mm -hmm. I used to love it there. Had a great pro. You could sort of spar with him because you know that he wouldn't batter you because he could control himself. I went to one sparring session, just a general session, and I got absolutely <laughs> battered. <laughs> Yeah, it was tough, but I love it. I love the sport, but I do love the sport and I admire the athletes. I think yeah. they're amazing. What's your take on YouTubers, boxing and all that kind of stuff? And Because it's obviously bringing a lot of attention to the sport. To be perfectly honest with you, Matt, I don't really mind it. Yeah. I think it's quite fun. I think if you're doing it for the right reasons, you know, there's a great opportunity to raise some money for amazing charities. And yeah. I think a few of them have done a lot for charity. I think, yeah, you know... My brother Paddy would never have been watching boxing and now yeah, yeah, yeah. he loves I'd it because of his favorite of YouTubers of boxing. Something that I find myself doing a lot is if I see a beautiful landscape or something, I will try and see if I can find an angle of it where there's nothing man-made mm. in the view. But you see a beautiful hill or something and there's a telephone pole <laughs> in the middle of it or a lamppost or something. So doing something like that, where there is nothing but just mother nature and yeah. the silence and being with yourself. No, where's, where's the place? I just took my, me and my wife just went to Bali. We went white water rafting and it nice. almost felt like Jurassic Park everywhere. Iceland. I I'd love to, to go, I got to, to, go Iceland. to Iceland. So I got to experience it with the documentary travelers and we went to a real glacier and we went to, Amazing. you know, and, and it was incredible to just, it was the first time I felt like I'd landed on another planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love being on the golf course. They all love playing golf. There's just something about the challenge of shooting lower than your lowest score that really kind of takes my mind off of the work. The interesting thing about golf is that you could be having a terrible day. You could be really upset about something. And if you play really well, you completely forget about it. If you play really badly, you then are playing badly because of what's happening outside of golf. It's like a really weird kind of... Catch 22, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I love it. I think when I'm playing good golf is when I feel most like myself. I've only ever played golf like twice in my life. Right. And I totally get the point of how humbling it is, is 
Horrendous. Mate, you can sign the biggest deal of your life and go out to play golf to celebrate and it will ruin your day. <laughs> like absolutely ruin Don't your day. Don't go out to play golf to celebrate. No, no, no. crazy. No. Do you play, do you still play any sport? But then Jack said, look down. And we looked down and it came from beneath us. And what has been such an interesting experience for me was as soon as I saw the whale, I wasn't scared anymore because I could just tell that it wasn't going to eat me. You, I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but you could just see from its body language. I remember it so vividly. It swam up to us. It was maybe 10 meters below us. And it was kind of motionlessly sort of just looking at us. And then it kind of rolled on its back. And it did this weird thing where it kind of put its head like this. And you could see its eye. Like we were having this crazy like moment. And then it just swam off and it was gone. And what they didn't know is that it was built by a team that was trying to show that what people didn't notice is that in every picture she posted, she was drinking. And it was a made up, it was almost like original AI wow. that was made up to prove the point that you can love someone and you can think you're really close to them and you, you can think their lifestyle looks amazing, but actually they've got a drink in every picture they post and you didn't realize they had an alcohol problem. So I can't, can't remember who built that page. Well, that, that, I think that's one of the problems with alcohol is that if you came out with alcohol right now, if alcohol wasn't a thing and you like, I've invented this drink that is going to, make you like either really happy or really aggressive or really stupid and we're going to just sell it to the masses and it's one of those things because it is so socially acceptable the the addiction side of it the bad sides of it really do fly under the radar yeah and that's really interesting one of the things you mentioned was finding alternatives mm -hmm. and during my monk life we always talked about how there was there was something that we called the higher taste so you know i really really hold high the opinions of people that i really care about I'm also really lucky to have an amazing group of fans who are so supportive. They are diehard. They are there day one. And that makes me feel really good. But I, I do think a lot of my lessons in life have come from my dad and the ways that he can deal with things, things that he hasn't done very well in the past that he's passed on to me. And, and I'd love to see him back on top and to, to have some clarity and, and to be a champion again. Because I admire him as an athlete. I see someone like Ed Sheeran. Yeah, like 80,000 people in the palm of his hand. I think comedians are equally as talented. The ability that they can just go on stage and make people laugh. Yeah, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. And at the end of the day, it's just, it's, it's taking what you can from, from what you aspire for, though, right? Like you, you can take something from all these people. And we always think we need access to people directly in sure. order to learn from them. But, but I feel mentored by them yeah, wow. without ever having sat in the same room as them. Like I want wow. that. And it just, it's so hard to explain because everyone's like, well, how did you know that at 18? And I was like, I don't know. It must've been how powerful he was. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you wake up when, when the sun's out and the light's out and you just wake up because you, you feel that energy. And I felt it through him. And then I, I went to university and I'd talk to him and I'd meet him in the summers and Christmases. But I just decided, I was like, I want to do this because I'd met someone who I felt had emotional and mental mastery in a way that I'd never seen before. Another place that I've loved nature-wise, India, of course, we, we mentioned a few years ago and my friend was filming a, uh, a documentary out there. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go, I to, got to, Iceland. go to Iceland. So I got to experience it with the documentary travelers and we went to a real glacier and we went to, Amazing. you know, and, and it was incredible to just, it was the first time I felt like I'd landed on another planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, I literally, I was like, this looks like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. Like I'm on another, like I, I could have, yeah. I could have gone into outer space and landed on another There's planet. a reason why every single space film, Iceland is the first on the list for locations. 